Today, it's time for me to share with you my thoughts on the Avatar HD system. Now, in today's video, we're going to take a closer look at these, the Fat Shark Dominator Digital FPV goggles, first of all. We'll then move on to the Avatar Digital VTX, and then we'll take a look at the actual system performance. I'll share with you some footage. I'll then give you my thoughts and my experiences having spent some time with it. And then at the very end, I'll give you my opinion on if I think you should consider buying this product or not. Now, just to be clear up front, this video has not been sponsored by anyone. However, I want to say a massive thank you to all of my Patreons and supporters. I would not have been able to buy this system without the support of my Patreons or the people who donated to the channel. I want to say a massive, massive thank you from me for making this video possible. Anyway, let's get on with it. Let's take a closer look at the goggles first of all. So to start with the goggles. Now these are the Fat Shark Dominators. When you get them, they come in a nice box and once you open that up, you will find this case inside. This is a semi-rigid protective case, typical of what you usually see with Fat Shark goggles. When you open it up, you will find the new Fat Shark Dominator goggles inside. Alongside the goggles themselves, you will find a power cable. This is a direct power cable. There's no back on this and it goes straight to the goggles. You'll have a cleaning cloth, which you can see I've used already, and you'll have a little set of shims as well for the goggles too. Now, these are the brand new Dominator goggle from Fat Shark that are a digital only goggle designed to be used with the Avatar system from Walksnail. For that system, there are two sets of goggles available. You have these Fat Sharks and then you have their own basically identical version of the goggles sold under the Walksnail brand. As far as we know, there will be no VTXs being sold by Fat Shark. You simply have the Fat Shark goggles for that system or the Walksnail goggles and then the Walksnail VTXs. Now, these, as I've said, are a digital only goggle. They do not have any form of analog input. They only accept input via that Avatar HD system. Walking you around, you can see that we have four antennas, two on the top and two on the front. Looking at it, as you're seeing here, three of these antennas are receive and one of them is transmitting my tests. This antenna, this antenna and this antenna are receive antennas and that antenna is transmit only. It's worth noting that because it could have an impact on your system and you want to get your best possible antenna performance from this by adding antennas onto that port specifically as well as the other three but making sure that you do have an antenna on that one. Do not just install two on this system. You can see on the top on this side here we have a record button because there is a built-in DVR. We have a back button and then on the corner there is a five-way D button similar to as we've seen on DJI. Next to that is a bind button and then in the center you can see there's a little fan symbol and this is the adjustment for the internal fan for the anti-fog mechanism that blows air over the displays. Flipping the goggles over you will see underneath we have our focus and IPD adjustment. They are a combined adjustment, so you can slide it either side to adjust or you can rotate the knob for adjusting the focus. You have a power button. Yes, there is a power button on a set of Fat Shark goggles. This feels more like a soft power button. It doesn't latch in or out, but you do need to press it to turn the goggles on. And then below that, there is a USB-C port. Now, this USB-C port offers full video out via a HDMI to USB-C adapter. It does not offer video input, but you can replicate the display on the goggles on a compatible display device with a HDMI to USB-C cable. And we'll take a look at that a little bit more later on in the video. Looking at the face mask area here, you can see our optics that allow us to view the two 1080p OLED displays that are built into the goggles. They have a 46 degree field of view. They have an adjustable IPD of 58 to 70 and a focus range of plus 2 to minus 6 as standard. You can see in the middle there is an SD card slot typically located for a set of Fat Shark goggles and that allows you to record your footage to the onboard DVR and then you can see the little ear ducts there for the anti-fog mechanism. You can see if I move the adjustment is there which allows us just to do the IPD in focus allowing you to just get the best possible images from those built-in OLED displays. Now, just covering the main spec on these goggles. So obviously we have 
two 1080p OLED displays with a field of view of 46 degrees, very similar to the HDO2's, the Skyzone 04 axis, narrower than DJI, but certainly wider than the Orcas. We have a voltage input range of 7 to 21 volt or 2 to 5S. Just note that that is lower than you get on the equivalent goggle from Walksnail that apparently support up to 6S. They have that USB-C HDMI output, which allows you to replicate what you see on the display on an external display, but it is a direct replication, including all of the OSD as well. There's a power button, there's anti-fogging. We've also got the built-in DVR, and you've got the antenna inputs, obviously, for the digital system, of which there are four with RP-SMA connectors. Just a couple of other quick points I want to make on the Fat Shark goggles. A, they do not include antennas with them as standard. So if you buy them, you're going to have to buy your own. Bit of a shame that compared to the Avatar goggles from Walksnail that do include antennas but basically the same price and are compatible with the same system. Now, in all of my testing, I've actually been using the DJI B1 antennas. I have two on the top and then I have two of their extended antennas on the front. The reason I specifically chose them is because it allows me to have a good baseline compared to the DJI FPV system. I know they're not the best antennas in the world, but I do have a lot of experience with them and it allows me to actually do comparison and take the antennas out of the equation. Finally, just the last thing I want to mention is about the head strap. It isn't the greatest in the world. It's quite narrow and it is quite basic. It does have this adjustable section here that folds over and sticks, but it certainly isn't the best one I've seen. Now, with regards to being able to upgrade this, it does look like you can remove the hoop that's down there, but the hoop is all the way around, so I don't know if you're going to be able to actually get another strap on there. You may have to take it off and actually cut it to allow you to get in because there doesn't appear to be a gap in the metal that goes all the way around. Okay, jumping over to the Walk Snail VTX. Now it's worth noting that Fat Shark are not making VTXs for this system themselves. So we have the Fat Shark Dominator goggle and the Walk Snail Avatar goggle that are all compatible with the Walk Snail Avatar HD. VTX. Now this one I've got here is the Nano Kit, so that is the smaller 14 by 14 mil camera which we'll take a look at in a second. Now when we get the box open inside from the look of it, it's all held in place with some foam. There is a pull out tag but it didn't seem to want to work on mine, it's actually held in very, very tight. You can see in the kit, we have a small USB cable. This is what plugs into the VTX to allow us to access the onboard storage because it doesn't take an SD card. It actually records directly on board the VTX because there's eight gigs of RAM on board. We have our VTX itself with our camera connected. You can see that's pre-wired already. We then have our two included antennas that they include in the package. And then we've got a couple of other extra accessories too. We've got an adapter as well as our wiring harness for connecting as well. Just concentrating on some of the spec of the VTX and then the camera. So as I've said, the VTX has eight gigs of onboard storage. It weighs 16 grams. It supports eight channels, just like the other systems and has a power input of six volt to 25.2, which basically means it supports two to six S. It supports beta flight canvas mode or MSP OSD via the MSP protocol, which we'll look at later in the video and it supports two antennas via UFL connectors that are held on this side here under this little sheet of metal. Now, both the antennas on this and the camera connector has this piece of metal retainer that helps keep everything in place. In the box, obviously, it comes with that already connected, but if we just flip it over, you can see that there's a couple of screws that we can undo to put our antennas on, and we'll take a look at that in a second as well. Now, as standard, this unit supports up to 700 milliwatts, but there is a 1200 milliwatt hack available for this as well. We then simply have our main connector for connecting to our flight controller, which will have our power and our UART connection, and then we have that little plug down here for the USB connection, allowing us to offload our footage via that USB cable. Now, as I said, I went for the nano camera model on this. It has a one half point seven inch sensor, supports 1080p 60, 720p 120 frames a second, or 720p 60. Again, 
just like the DJI system and it supports both 16x9 and 4x3. Now, for me, there's a little bit of confusion over the spec because they say the lens on this is 2.1mm with 170 degrees field of view with an f2.0 lens, but they're saying that for both cameras. So I'm not 100% sure what the situation here is with this one. The very basics are it offers 1080p 60 or 720p 120 stroke 60, those last two just like DJI, but the newer one is that 1080p 60 that we didn't have before, and that is what will record onto the onboard DVR if selected as well. A couple of other things you do also need to be aware of on this VTX. Its size is 33 by 33 by 9.5, but it has 25.5 by 25.5 mounting pattern. That isn't particularly common in this size or style of VTX for normal size quads. However, that's the one they've gone with. Also worth noting that the covers on this VTX are not actually screwed in place. They will come off if you give them a tug. They do require the bolts through the holes on your frame to actually hold the heat sink to the main PCB. If you don't put bolts through this, that heatsink will actually separate and come off. To mount the supplied antennas, we simply need to undo the screws that is located over here. So we've got three, one either side and then one in the middle. Once removed, we can then pull off the little metal sheet and you can see then it exposes the UFL connections. So we can then simply pop our antennas on nice and carefully making sure that we get the UFL squarely in place on the connector. It can be a little bit of a press just to get it to lock in. There we go. That's the one. And then we will pop the second one on. There we go. Both of them now on. And then we can simply put the retaining metal back over the top pop the three screws in, and then that just makes sure that our UFLs, A, don't pop off in flight accidentally or in a crash, but they also then ensure that you're not going to rip the UFL off the board, or at least hopefully add some additional protection to not rip the UFL from the board in the event of a bit of an off. Just one other thing on the VTX and that is the MIPI cable. Now here I've got two from my DJI system. Whilst the connector on the walk snail system is exactly the same, these cables do not work. This one is a Caddx accessory cable and this one is one of the original DJI ones. I've tried both and they do not work on the walk snail system. Having dived into it a bit more, it appears that these connections are not fully wired. There are actually 13 inputs on each side of the connector, so a total of 26. However, only 10 of them are wired on both of these cables, and the others are labelled as NC or not connected on the information we've got. However, the chances are on the walk snail system, they've actually utilised those additional six cables, but they're not wired in these, so we can't use these cables unfortunately. Next, I'm just going to walk you through the menu and setting options on the goggles. Now, to do this, I've currently got the HDMI cable connected to the USB-C port, and I'm recording this on my YOLO Box Pro, and you're seeing the image from the actual camera on the aircraft. What we're going to do first is go into the settings menu, and here you can see the first screen is the channel menu. From this, we can actually select all of the channels we have available on the system. Currently, you can see it's unlocked to eight. Depending on your area and region, it may be option of four only. However, you can unlock that with some hacks is the term I'll use. They're not really hacks. They're more sort of opening up functionality via text files, very similar to what we've seen on the DJI system. Again, there's one available for eight channels and one available for up to 1200 milliwatts output as well. They're not exactly the same files, but they are very, very similar. Moving across, you can see we've got the share menu. This is where you would have the option for what we would know as the DJI Spectator mode. This is the mode that allows you to actually use a set of goggles with someone else's system. Not currently functional on this version of firmware yet. 
Next, we have the main settings menu, and this is where we actually change the settings on the system. If we go down into here, we have the options for the camera, the display, the record set, as well as the device. And then below this, you have the other options such as transmission power, frame rate, whether you want low latency mode or standard mode, standby mode, which is the low power mode on DJI, resolution, 720p or 1080p, bit rate mode, which isn't functional yet, as well as the language and the low battery mode down the bottom there. Now, I'm not going to change any of the settings on this because if I do it, it will affect the recording output you're seeing. But basically, frame rate is standard or high, which is 120 frames a second or 60, and resolution is 720p or 1080p. And that's the basic options you have there. And then obviously, you can turn the standby mode on or off. Under the menu options then above this, we have the options for the camera, allowing us to select the scene, whether we want it day, we can do day, race, night, and we can select what option we want there. We've got sharpness settings, we've got the aspect ratio, we've then got the EV for the exposure, the white balance options, so whether you want auto white balance or you want to actually fix it, I would advise fixing it on this camera. You've then got the option to rotate the camera 180 degrees if you want to, if you put it in upside down, and then you've got the saturation options as well. If we go back, we've then got the display option, so if I click on this, this allows us to zoom in or out. We've got the brightness, the focalization mode or focus mode, this doesn't actually work at the moment. And then you've got the flight controller OSD option that allows you to actually have that MSP OSD on the display. Next, you've got the record set menu under here. You've got all the options for the DVR on the VTX and the goggles. So you can select whether you want it to record on the goggles, the VTX or both. You've got the takeoff recording option. So auto record on takeoff. You've got the options to format the SD card and VTX, as well as the recording loop and the recording resolution as well on the VTX. Finally, you've got the device menu under here. You'll find things such as the device info for checking your firmware version, your instructions, your options for the ranging mode, the reset all, and the buzzer options. The nice thing with the instructions is if you click on that, it actually brings up a display showing you all of the basic controls and functions of the goggles. Okay, so just to share with you some thoughts on the Fatshock Dominator goggles and then the Walksnail VTX before we move on to talk about the avatar system itself. Now, the goggles, first of all, they are very, very good. In fact, they're some of the best goggles I've used. The image quality on the displays is fantastic. The fit and finish is very high quality and the fitment on the face is very, very good as well. Whilst there are a few minor niggles, overall, they have done a fantastic job on this headset. Those niggles include the fact that the focus adjustment is very sensitive. I don't think the anti-fogging is quite as good as it could be. I have had it fog up a little bit a few times, although that might simply be to the placement of the foam around the eyepieces and blocking the actual airflow, and that's something I want to take a bit more of a look at later. Obviously, there is the fact that there is no analog input on these is obviously going to bring complaints, but from a digital FPV goggle point of view, I really don't feel there is anything majorly wrong or anything they really could have done better other than moving that damn SD card slot to the bottom and not between the eyepieces in the middle. Moving over to the VTX, and there are some annoyances here. The biggest being the 25.5 mounting pattern. It just makes installation into a traditional 4 or 5 inch frame difficult, and it doesn't install easily into anything I had. Furthermore, it's also annoying that the micro camera version comes with a shorter MIPI cable, and the fact that you can't use any of your existing DJI ones as well means you're going to be stuck trying to shoehorn this one in on a traditional frame towards the front and not be able to put it at the back like many frames have been designed to be having VTXs installed in. It's also annoying the fact that they haven't actually screwed the heat sinks together on the VTX, and whilst they are in place, you do need to make sure you've put bolts through, or at least cable ties through, otherwise you could find the actual side separate and leave the internals exposed. The overall quality of the camera appears very, very good, and we will talk about that as we move on through the video. There's also that onboard DVR and the limitations that that comes with. Whilst it does have 
up to eight gig of onboard storage. You're getting less than seven, and that's only really useful for about four to six flights in 1080p. It's also a mild annoyance that you've got to use that dedicated cable for offloading, but more than that, what's annoying is the fact that it is very, very slow to offload the footage, and in my tests, I was getting about 11 to 12 megabytes a second of data transfer. Next, it's time to talk about the system. And what we're going to do first of all is take a look at some footage. Now, I'm going to share with you various pieces of footage that I have recorded on the goggles. I have done it in different modes and frame rates, but everything has been recorded on the goggles DVR. There is nothing here from the VTX DVR. And the reason for that is I wanted to share with you as realistic view of what you would see through the goggles as possible. What we'll do as we move through is I'll try and explain some of the things as well. We'll take a look at some basic footage in 1080p, 720p 60. We'll then talk a bit around its penetration performance as well as its latency performance and some of the quirks around that. We'll move on to 720p 120 frames a second and again talk about some penetration performance and then we'll come back and discuss my findings on the system before I give you my final thoughts.
Next, I want to share with you a bit of a quick comparison between the DJI system and the Avatar system. Now, to do this, I ended up creating a bracket that allowed me to bolt a Vista on top of my Avatar aircraft and actually record the DJI system and the Avatar system at the same time. Both of these were recorded on the actual goggles, both at 720p60, although there is some difference in the power outputs because I needed to make some tweaks to allow the two systems to play nicely side by side. Anyway, hopefully this will give you an idea of how the two systems look in the same flight. In the next couple of clips, you're going to see a bit of signal loss behavior between the two systems as I come around the trees. Now, take into account that they are not running at the same power level. The DJI system is at absolute minimum, whereas the Avatar isn't. This is the only way I could actually get them to behave together on the same aircraft. So whilst you will see that the Avatar seems to last longer, that isn't apples for apples. One observation though I will make is that the Avatar system has a much more cliff edge approach to signal loss compared to the DJI system. As you can see, the DJI will get progressively worse and more blocky, whereas the Avatar tends to hold up more and then I get a sudden loss in signal. To demonstrate this a bit more, I did some very specific tests at the bottom of some fields. I was actually sitting right at the top beyond the horizon you can see there and actually flew down to the bottom and then I was lowering the aircraft basically below the horizon at this point so I would get the signal cut off and if you watch the delay or the latency numbers you will see that it holds up fairly well and then it will just instantly jump to a couple of hundred milliseconds it is very very much cliff edge in the way it behaves and you can see that in this chart here this is based on the srt file and shows you the actual behavior of the system and you can see the latency is low and then it suddenly jumps up to some very very high numbers now we can't say for sure if the info we're getting out of the system is 100% correct, but what it does show is that the behavior is different to what we are used to with the DJI system. Finally, I just wanted to throw in a little bit of 720p, 120fps footage. Now, again, this is just me moving around in a car park, nothing particularly interesting or special, but what I wanted to also do at the same time was a bit more latency testing 
on the aircraft and overall see how it behaved, but also see how it behaved from a penetration point of view, especially in this low latency mode. Now, I moved it around this building here several times. The first time I did it, I actually had quite a loss of signal, which you will see now, but it doesn't really show it on the goggles image right here where I moved the aircraft I had a massive set of dropped frames on my display however that hasn't actually shown up in the goggles footage I have seen that a few times happen as well and there are occasions where your DVR on the goggles actually doesn't necessarily show some of the jitters that I've seen on the display now, again, I was just moving it around here, but the interesting point is that that building is directly between me and the aircraft. And I go back around it a few times and you will actually see that I am still getting very decent results, even though that building is between me and the aircraft. You'll see here, we just again come over the top and I'll come around again, but this time lower this time just seeing how the signal behaves as we come down we'll drop down into this corner where i am directly opposite behind that building at that point and along here again completely obstructing my view of the aircraft it's only this point here would i actually be in view but i'm actually lower than this point as well so it's quite interesting just to see how well this system can work again you can see there is a loss of signal but it isn't particularly terrible to show you here with the srt file data on board and again this time i come down and pretty much stop in the direct opposite corner to where i am with the building in the way just to see how the system performs i am completely obstructed i am much lower than the aircraft at this point as well yet the signal is holding up so this system does have some real potential with regards to its penetration performance Okay, so it's time for me to share with you my thoughts on the Avatar system. Now, as I said earlier, the hardware on this system is very good. Yes, there's some quirks with that VTX. I wish the shape was different and some stuff like that. However, there's nothing terrible here. Overall, that side of things is pretty decent. So that leaves us with the questions of how the actual system performs from an RF and image quality and behavior point of view. Now, as you can see in the footage I've showed, overall, this system can look very, very good when it is working properly. However, the point I'm going to make there is when it is working properly, because I have found it to be massively variable. There are times where it probably looks like the best system from an FPV point of view I have used, but there are also times where it is virtually unusable. There are a boatload of bugs in this system, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute, and there is some real quirks around the RF behavior that will try to catch you out. The latency is very good when it's low, but there are massive jumps in the latency, it spikes out of the blue, and you do get some jitters 
colors in the image as well. There's also some strange quirks that I see a jitter in the goggles, but I don't see it on the DVR footage. But also the way that RF behavior works is very different to what we've seen, for instance, on DJI in the sense that it really is very much a cliff edge approach compared to DJI that again, does have a cliff, but you can rely on the data with DJI to tell you what's going on. With this, it just drops. It literally will show good, 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 and then you'll see the latency spike absolutely massively and you lose the image. There is very little progressive movement towards a signal loss and you certainly cannot trust the information that the data is showing you on the latency numbers because simply it will change in the blink of an eye and you can have a loss of signal. The overall RF behavior of the system is decent when it's working well, but as I've said, it does have those quirks. With regards to how it actually performs from a range point of view, I'm not gonna go into numbers, but I do wanna say this. 25 milliwatt CE users are going to find things pretty poor based on my experience. I'm not going to go into too much on that, but what I'm going to say is if you're in the UK and you want to fly legally, I would certainly hold back a minute because it doesn't appear to have anywhere near the performance of that output as DJI does. Now, as I said, there are a boatload of issues in this system at the moment. I found a huge amount of quirks in the system, which I've actually posted up on the Walksnail website for them to see. There's one or two here, which I think are pretty fundamental that need resolving. The biggest being that it doesn't always connect when you have the system set to channel one. So what happens is you turn the goggles on and then you turn the VTX on and it simply sits there flashing the light. The only way to get it to connect is change the channel on the goggles from say one to two and the VTX will connect. Whilst that in itself isn't a major problem, the actual problem is that will happen in a signal loss scenario as well if you're using channel one. I have personally tested that myself and what will happen is if you actually break the link on channel one and the signal drops, it may not always reconnect unless you change it to channel two and then it kicks in. This behavior doesn't seem to happen on channel two and three. I haven't tested all of them, but I did do a test on those. So it's clear that there are some bugs in there that does need resolving. There's also some other quirks, such as the fact it has a habit of sticking on three megabits a second mode. So rather than showing 25, it locks on three and won't change unless you again change channel on the unit and then it kicks out of it. And there's a whole list of other little quirks and issues that I picked up that I did share with them over on their Facebook page. When talking about this compared to DJI, there are many elements about it that are very different. It's not only the way that signal drop behavior is, but it's also the way it actually compresses the image too. Even comparing it with focus mode turned off on DJI, this very much crushes the greens in a pretty bad way, whereas DJI does compress the image, but it doesn't seem to go to the quite extreme level of compression that this does. Hopefully there's work they can do on that codec to improve that, because whilst, as I've said, at times it does look fantastic, in others it is frankly horrible and people would not want to fly it when it is looking like that. Now I have done so much flying with this system over the last week and I've been testing it in many different scenarios and the footage that I've shown you is just a small selection. I've got footage that looks good, I've got footage that looks horrible. More than anything though, I just wanted to share with you what the system can do when it is working properly, but you need to take into account that the behavior on this system as of today is just so variable. In my testing, I did find that recording on the VTX seemed to make the system perform worse overall. And since I stopped recording at the ear side, the performance has actually improved and it seems to be behaving a little bit better overall. Also, it's interesting when you compare it to DJI on how it performs with regards to penetration. I was showing you in that footage me flying around the back of the building, and whilst I haven't done a specific test there with DJI as well, what I can say is when it is working well, it is impressive just how well the image quality will hold up. But again, you've got to take into account that when it drops, it drops, and you cannot rely on any of that data on the screen to tell you when that's about to happen because it just falls off that cliff and that latency spikes through the roof. 
So where does this leave my thoughts on the system? Well, the reality is, as far as I'm concerned today, this is a beta product and should be sold as such. I don't think it's fair to call it alpha because when it works, it does work very well, but it is variable in its nature and it certainly is not a polished and finished product like we have from DJI. It has massive potential to be one of the best options in digital FPV. It has great image quality. It has the features that we've asked for for ages, such as the full OSD and it seems to be a company that does want to listen to what the community wants. However, there is also no history about what this company is capable of doing. We don't know what their development path is like, what their capabilities are. And as of today, it remains to be seen just how long it will take them to get this up to speed or even if they can do it at all. Because again, we simply have no history to go by. I think the product is extremely good if it worked properly, but today it doesn't and as such it can only be classed as a beta and you should take that into account before making any purchase decisions. If you're happy to jump in knowing that it may not be working correctly in the next six months, then I can happily say go for it. However, if you're looking to pick up the next off the shelf ready to go product, as of now, this is not it, but it certainly has the potential to be it in the future. So in the end, the best comments I can use is buyer beware, understand it's a beta product and only jump in if you're happy to accept that. I'm really interested to see how it develops. And if you want to see what my experience is with this as we move forward, please do make sure you're a subscriber of the channel. That way you'll get updates when I do release more videos on this product in the future. I want to say a massive thank you to all of my patrons. I would not have been able to make these videos without your support. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who supported the channel to allow us to buy this equipment. If you're interested in helping us continue to do that, there is a link to my Patreon as well as buy me a coffee in the description too. Anyway, that's it from me on this one. Stay safe. I will speak to you soon.